If you have your Bibles with you today, we are in the Gospel of John, where we have been since uh, January, as we've been moving through this Gospel and doing it very carefully with both church and Sunday school. And uh, so we will not have Sunday school today, so just this message on John today, and we'll pick it up again next week from there. Uh, here's where we've been by way of review. You know, you always start the new year with a review, right? Well, here's our review of where we've been with John, hitting the highlights. Uh, Jesus has been saying some amazing things about himself. I've been saying all along, it amazes me how people can talk about Jesus and say, well, he was just a good teacher, just a wise man. They obviously have never read the Gospels because every time Jesus talks about himself, it has confounded those religious authorities that thought he was just a man. Uh, he, he said increasingly amazing statements about who he is. To Nicodemus, he told him he was nothing less than the way of salvation to this Jewish scholar. Uh, he said that uh, the dead will hear his voice and rise. That's an interesting statement to make about yourself. That's what Jesus said. He said that Moses was writing about him back when Moses wrote. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those are the books Moses wrote. He made the claim that he was the bread of life, that people would have to, in a sense, eat him to live. He said those who call on him will be saved. Again, the way of salvation. He said if you believe in him, from your innermost being will flow rivers of life. He said, to know him is to know the Father. He said to those Jews, before Abraham was, I am. By the way, I am is a quote of the name God gave himself to Moses back in the burning, at the burning bush. Before Abraham was, I am. The Jews knew what he was saying. They picked up stones to stone him. That was blasphemy. He was saying he was God. He was Yahweh. To make it even more clear after that, he said, I and the Father are one. How more clear can he make it? Those who say Jesus claimed just to be a good teacher have not read a word that Jesus said. And then was the kicker to Martha, right before the raising of Lazarus, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Martha was saying, yes, I know we're all going to rise again on the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. Try to get your mind around that one. I am the resurrection. In other words, he was saying, the resurrection of the dead is all about me. Eternal life is all about me. That's what Jesus was saying. And that's the crescendo. Every one of these statements got more grandiose and grandiose until he finally said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. That's where we left off last time. And then his miracles. He backed up what he said by doing miracles. Changing water into wine. Not just wine, the best wine. Healing the sick. Healing the sick without even being there. Saying, your son to a man who was miles away is now healed. And when he got the report at that moment, he was healed. Not even having to be there. Uh, feeding 5,000 people with a couple of loaves and a, couple of, and a few fish. And having 12 baskets left over. That was a good one. And then there was, at that point, the greatest one of all. The healing of a man born blind. They'd never seen anything like that. I mean, it wasn't even really healing. To be healed, you have to have better, better before and gotten sick and gotten back to normal. This guy was brought back to where he never was. He never saw. His eyes had never seen light. And he healed him completely, instantaneously. And then the crescendo of all the miracles, once again, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And he had been dead four days. You may not know this. There was a Jewish myth, a Jewish belief that was kind of midrashic, that the spirit of the dead person hovers over the body for three days and then leaves. It's not biblical truth. It was a Jewish legend. Uh, Jesus basically uh, 
just proved that when he told the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise, as did Paul when he said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But there's a lot of Jews that actually believe this. The spirit of a dead person hovered over the body for three days, then left. Jesus, upon realizing that Lazarus was dead, waited two days before he made the two-day journey from across the Jordan to Bethany to heal him. So when he got there, he was four days dead. Even by the Jews that believed in myths, he was dead dead. He was thinking. And he raised him from the dead. The crescendo of the miracles. All those things. That's where we left off was on, with, with Lazarus and that raising. That was a crescendo of what he said about himself, about the miracles he did. It was also the crescendo of the opposition against him. Look in your Bibles to John chapter 11, beginning with 47. This is from the last uh, thing we looked at, but we're going to go through that in, in preparing for this one. So after all that, Verse 47 of chapter 11 of John. Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. By the way, when they convened a council, that means, now they'd been talking about killing him all along and it was getting more and more obvious they were intent on doing it. Now they called a council. Now they called the Sanhedrin together. Their official ruling body to condemn Jesus to death. He said in verse 48, if we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. You can see where their mind was. They weren't concerned of who Jesus was, that maybe God was here doing something. The Romans let them have their own religion as long as they didn't make waves. So part of their job was to lead the people. Part of their job was to keep down any uh, rabble rousing that goes on. And their thought of this was, wow, this, we're going to get our, our freedom taken away by Rome because of this guy. Then one of them, Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people, that the whole nation shall perish. He says, come on, guys, this is simple. This guy has to die or we're all going to suffer. But what's interesting is what John says about that in commentary, verse 51. Now, he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. John says, this guy was just saying, we got to kill this guy for the sake of everyone else. But he was saying much more than that. He was actually giving a correct prophecy that, geez, one person was going to die for the sake of mankind. So from that day forth, verse 53, they planned together to kill him. The Sanhedrin, the official ruling council, put a contract out on Jesus at that point. That's the crescendo of opposition. It was now made official by the ruling body. He was going to die. Therefore, Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, but went away from there to the country near the wilderness into the city called Ephraim, and there he stayed with his disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was near. And many went up to Jerusalem out of the country before the Passover to purify themselves. So they were seeking for Jesus and were saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he was to report it so that they might seize him. By the way, this is the third Passover. We know this from the Gospel of John because John pointed out all of these festivals. This is now the third one. John is how we know Jesus had a three-year ministry, by the way. The other Gospels, it's not that clear how long he ministered. John has these festivals down. He points out every Passover, every major festival, this is the third one. And so Jesus, who was kind of hiding out because there was an official contract out on his head that was going to be carried out by these Jewish leaders, uh, for the Passover, he was coming because it was his last Passover. It was the appointed time. Verse 12, or excuse me, chapter 12, verse 1, is where we start today. The official text of today now. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So he's coming to Jerusalem. His first stop is the place where he had a custom of staying in Bethany. At the place of Mary, Martha, Lazarus. We don't know much about them. I, it seems that Mary and, and Martha were living together unmarried. Lazarus was there too. 
whether in the same house or just kind of in a compound. You know, households were different back in Bible times than they are today. We think of a household, we think of the husband, the wife, and the kids. Household in the New Testament times was the clan. Think of more, more sort of like what the Nordgrens have going out on the farm. That was more like a household of the Old Testament. Or maybe the Millers, who have all, all their kids living within 60 miles, very unusual for today. Or the Seitzmas, who now that Vicky has moved back, have theirs sort of close by. But anyway, they were living in the same, if not the same house, in the same compound, area, whatever. And so he comes there. Verse 2, they made him supper there, and Martha was serving. We can stop there and say, yeah, that figures. If you know anything about Martha, not out of John, but another gospel has that episode where she is doing all the work, and Mary's just sitting at Jesus' feet, and Martha is quite upset and says, Jesus, tell her to help me. And, and Jesus says, Martha, you're getting a little anxious about the, the wrong things here. She's doing the right thing. And evidently, Martha learned. She's now serving without fussing about it. She's learned that it's okay, that that's her thing. She's a servant. Boy, my mom was like that. She was a servant. She lived to serve. She served us. She served my dad. When my dad died, we said, wow, mom is finally going to have some time and life for herself. She lasted six months. She had no one to serve. That was Martha. So here she's doing that. By the way, I could get into a side thing on the body of Christ here and how we tend to think if we are really passionate about a ministry, we think everything, everyone should be passionate about the same ministry as us. And people leave churches because nobody else has the passion for this ministry. I'm going to a church where they have that passion. And what they've done is they've taken God's presence of that ministry out of the church and taken it to one that doesn't need it. Body of Christ stuff. Learn from Martha. She was okay now with serving. That was her thing. You know what Mary's thing was? Worshiping. Mary. Oh, verse, verse 2, it also says, Ra Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table. He was healthy and well, eating with the gang. Then Mary took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of of perfume. Very costly scented oil that we are told later on in this passage was worth almost an entire year's wage. I mean, think in today's terms of tens of thousands of dollars in this 12 ounce little vial or whatever it was that she had. And our minds are boggled when we think of that because culturally that makes no sense. This had to be her most precious possession. This had to be. This had to be the most costly thing that she possessed. Now, why would someone spend that, a year's wage virtually on a bottle of perfume? Remember, cultures are very, very different. And you, other cultures looking at ours, trust me, we got some weird stuff. We've talked about this before. Every culture is, and especially these old, evidently, that was the thing that you would want to have. What did she have it for? We don't know. It might have been for a future wedding or funeral, or maybe to take care of all the funerals of the family, to anoint them with, but whatever it was, this was something that was considered ultimately precious, the scent of which was the best scent on earth they knew. It's interesting that John points out the entire room was filled with the scent. She takes this, think tens of thousands of dollars, her most prized possession, and pours it on Jesus' feet and wipes with her hair, and the whole room is filled with this precious, expensive aroma. This, my friends, is worship at its purest. This is giving the best you have freely to Jesus for his glory, for his anointing, pure worship. See, that's really what worship is. Worship isn't singing to music. I mean, we can worship, when, and we do. That's why we call it worship or praise. But worship is in the heart. It's offering yourself to Jesus. People that worship do really stupid things with money and expensive things. Because what Mary did was she recognized who Jesus was. She got it. 
she realized who it was that was reclining at the table in her house. All these things he'd been saying about himself, we went over those. She got it. So many, as you go through the gospel, as he's saying these things, the people around him don't get it. It says they believed, but they didn't get it. Mary got it. You know what happens when you get who Jesus is? Everything else in your world changes. Everything else loses its importance. When you understand who he is, there's nothing in your world that has the same value it once did. That's, that's part of what being born again is. The veil's taken off, and you get it. You see Jesus, who he is. I can remember very well in my life when I prayed this prayer and, you know, wasn't sure about what happened, and then all of a sudden, months down the road, I realized how much my life had changed when I wasn't trying to and started that moment when I opened my heart to him, and all of a sudden, I got it. And I said, wow, I, I can't do anything but serve this God with my life. Nothing else would make sense. He's real. This, really, this is history. He really walked this earth. He really performed these miracles. He really died on the cross and rose again, and he really is coming again. Everything changes. What's important now in your life? How much money you have? This, this uh, tens of thousands of dollar vial of perfume? Jesus is here. She likely knew he was going to die. She knew they were after him. He wasn't afraid to tell it. I'm coming to die. It's the plan. This was her last chance. She took her most precious thing and poured it out upon him for his glory. True worship. And then there's Judas Iscariot. Verse 4. Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples who was intending to betray Jesus, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii? That's how we know how expensive it was, by the way. And given to the poor. This is Judas. Now, he was thinking ministry, right? That's what they were doing. Jesus was going around healing people, and they were helping people. Good ministry. He missed Jesus. He saw the ministry, but he missed Jesus. He saw, well, this could help the poor. He didn't realize who was reclining right there at the table with him. It's more important to take care of those poor. By the way, there's, there's some good lessons to learn here. All ministry begins with worship. If ministry does not begin with worship, you're probably wasting your time. You're just doing good human works. You're just doing social work. And social work is fine, except that Jesus came to free slaves eternally, and helping people without Jesus is basically making their life a little bit more comfortable on the way to hell. Right? Social work without Jesus involved is like help making their life a little better on their way to hell. That's the social gospel. By the way, those who believe in the social gospel, that the ministry of serving Jesus is just doing good physical works, helping the poor and things like that, uh, what they do is they erase hell. They don't believe there actually is a true hell. They believe that the difficulties on earth are the hell that Jesus is talking about. So we're really working against hell when we do good work. That's the social gospel people. They're out there. They're all around. They're in churches around us. Their evangelism is food shelves and things like that. Now, those things are obviously really good and important. But it begins with worship of Jesus. If everything you're doing is not for Jesus, because of Jesus, and for the glory of Jesus, you're not really helping anybody, except maybe have a little better life. But when you bring Jesus into the equation, what you bring in is the hope of eternal life. This, my friends, is the gospel. Let's start the new year with clear theology. Let's get this right. That's what it's all about. It's all about Jesus. Our proclamation is Jesus Christ the one who has come into this world showing us what our problem really is, right? Not economics, not racism, not destroying the earth. Our real problem is our own estrangement from God. It's called sin in the Bible. 
And there's only one solution for that, because God's a holy God. And holy God means we must be exterminated in the same way these uh, pharisaical groups are intent on exterminating Jesus. That's God's holiness. Unholiness cannot stand before him. That's why we're told in Scripture that Jesus bore our sin, became sin for us, so that the holiness of God was poured out upon him. That's what the cross is all about. Let's get our theology straight. That's the cross. He was the sacrifice representing us, bearing our sin, so that the holiness of God was satisfied, and we were allowed to now experience his grace and his mercy. That's the gospel. Judas was wanting, well, we we're told later on what Judas really wanted, right? His excuse was that should have been given to the poor. But then we read on, verse 6, he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the money box, and he used to pilfer what was in it. What was important to Judas was money. What did he betray, betray Jesus for? 20 pieces of silver. He never did get Jesus. He never saw who he was like Mary did, even though he's with him the whole time. Isn't that interesting? But that's what we have there. And so Jesus responds. He says, let her alone so that she may keep it for my day of burial. Now, if you have a, I have a footnote on my Bible that says that keep it for the day of burial. May, it, it actually says that she may keep the custom of preparing the body for burial. I don't think he was saying, save some of it for my burial. I think he's saying, this is what she's doing. She's keeping the custom of preparing my body. He says, what she's doing is she, in a wonderful way, is getting me ready for what I'm about to do. And by the way, the next day, which we'll hear about next Sunday, is what we call the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. We aren't going to have the kids up waving palm branches on January the 8th, but that's what we're going through in John. The next day, he's going. See, the, the first half of John, we're at the halfway point here of this gospel. We've been going through it since September. The first half of it is three years of ministry. The last half of the gospel is one week, basically. The last chapter really is, is a little bit after that, but... Uh, that's what we have going here. So he's saying, leave her alone. Th this is what she's doing is highly symbolic. It was worship, and it was really preparing him for what he was about to uh, be going through. And then he makes an interesting statement. He says, you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. He wasn't downplaying giving to the poor or helping the poor there. He was saying, you're always going to be able to do that. Don't forget to worship when you have the opportunity. Once again, all work that is really God's work begins and is motivated by worship. In fact, it is worship. And Mary did what true worshipers do. She offered her very, very best to him. Remember the book of Malachi we went through back in the summertime? Of course you do. You remember all those summer sermons. I know that. It goes without saying. Malachi's beef against those people were they were not giving their best to God. They were going through the motions of doing their religious stuff and going to church and doing all the stuff you had to. And yeah, you had to do a sacrifice. So if you had one that was about to die anyway, perfect. Win-win. We'll give that one to God. And Malachi was saying, do you realize what you're doing? You're giving the slop to God. That's not worship. Their worship was worse than worthless. He said, I would rather just have the close and lock the doors of the church than come in and worship this way. They didn't have churches, of course, but that's a, you know, bring it to new times. Giving your best to God is what worship really is. People who truly worship, like I said, they do silly things. They do things that don't make any economical sense because their treasure is, is not in their bank account or their retirement account. Their treasure has been replaced by a far greater treasure, which is Jesus Christ. And I'm not up here one of those cult guys saying, now my next line, now, so therefore give to this. No, we don't do that. We give to where God leads us to give. And usually it's to those who have need. But true worship is giving yourself. How about those Macedonian Christians that Paul writes about 
in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, he talks about Macedonian Christians who, out of poverty, gave more than they had to give for the gospel ministry and begged him to take it. And you know what he says their key was? They first, you can read this, by the way, in 1 Corinthians 8, 2 Corinthians 8, I'm sorry, they first gave themselves to God. That's what Mary did. She gave herself her very best to Jesus. That, my friends, is what worship is. The conclusion of this section, a large crowd of Jews learned that he was there. And they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead, who evidently had become kind of a rock star. But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. Going away, in other words, from them, and believing in Jesus. So that sets the stage for what we go to next week when Jesus will, in fact, go into Jerusalem. But some good words in this on what it does mean to worship, what true Christian faith really is. It's not just coming to church and doing the stuff. Then we come to the communion table, which is what we go to now. A perfect way to start the year, is it not? Coming together over this, uh, this table and it is worship, but it's also more than that. When I went to seminary, I was taught, communion kind of this way, in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit came, these people were transformed. The veil, veil was taken off. They saw who Jesus was, saw who God was. They were different people. And they had new devotions. They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, which is the word of God. They were devoting themselves to prayer, which is communing with God. They were devoting themselves to fellowship, to being with one another. Those are brand new devotions. And they were devoting themselves to the breaking of bread, which is doing this. Now, apparently they did that every time they got together. But I was thought, you know what, that really is worship. They're devoting themselves to worship. But I want to add something more to that that I think is even more important. What we know about communion, it started, of course, at that last Passover meal. And by the way, in the, in the Gospel of John we're going through, you're not going to see the, the communion instituted. That's in the other Gospels. But a lot of people take those Gospel accounts for wh how they do communion, and basically what it's doing is describing the Passover feast when Jesus did something startling and amazing. He took the bread and said, this is my body given for you. And when he passed the cup, he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. But how did the early church do that? How we know that is from the writings of Paul in Second, or excuse me, First. I got to get my Corinthians straight. First Corinthians eleven, where he is explaining how the early church saw that. And so, First Corinthians chapter eleven. Here's what Paul writes. He says, "For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread." And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's start the new year by getting our theology right. You're not receiving Christ when you take that. You're remembering Christ. It's not the, the magic thing where you say the prayer and it turns into the body. That's found nowhere in Scripture. Here, the, what they did in the church, Paul says it very clearly to the Corinthians. Get this right. We do this in remembrance. He goes on to say, in the same way, he took the cup also after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. When we do this together, we remember the cross. We remember his death. And then it says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, this is verse 26 of chapter 11, 1 Corinthians, as long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what we do here. We are proclaiming the Lord's death. We are proclaiming the truth that he died bearing our sin. He became our sin. He became sin for us so that the penalty of sin was paid to the holiness of God. And we are now free to receive his grace and mercy. We're proclaiming the gospel when we do this. Nothing less. It's a regular proclamation of the gospel. Now, who are we proclaiming it to? Who is this table for? It's for believers. We're proclaiming it to ourselves. The Lord said, every time you do this, 
Preach the gospel to yourself. Remind yourself of what the ministry is all about. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the cross. Don't get lost in that, just that social thing without Jesus. It's about the cross. We take this bread. We, take the, we are internalizing the gospel as we proclaim it to ourselves so that we can take it with us, so that we can be the gospel, so that we can be the body of Christ. Continuing his work was to what? Seek and save the lost. Do you get it? It fits right in with this Mary thing. It's an act of worship. It's also an act of proclamation. But we proclaim every time the gospel to ourselves. Jesus died for my sin. That's the only way. He's the way, the truth, the life. He's the door. He's the only way you can be saved. All those other religions, it sounds really nice and very popular in our world to say they're all going to the same place. You know what? They're not. They don't teach the same things at all. And none of them touch on what this gospel lays hold of, which is God's own self-sacrifice for us. Grace and mercy coming together with truth and justice. The only possible way. It's a miracle. No human could have thought of it. That's what we proclaim to ourselves every time we hear this. Now, some of you have been taught, if you're not living right and got some things going on, don't do communion until you get it right. I ask you where you find that because you don't find it in Scripture. Paul goes on to say in this 1 Corinthians 11, therefore examine yourself, and then he says, and after examine yourself, then eat the bread and drink the cup. He doesn't say examine yourself to see if you're worthy. He says examine yourself before you do by all means eat it. I would say the only ones that I would say maybe don't take the bread and the cup is if you don't know who Jesus is. If you don't get it, if you don't get the cross, it's not for you. It's okay. It's not for you. But for all who believe, it's all about the cross. Do you have to get good enough to receive grace? You don't have to be good enough to do this table. I know you've been taught that some of you are going, this, uh, there's some godly teachers taught me that. I know. And I'm not right in everything I say either. But on this one, by the scripture, I'm pretty sure I'm right. It's for all who want to take it. So that's we're going a long time because I can. We don't have Sunday school. Isn't this awesome? (laughs) But this is important. Let's start right theologically. Let's get it right. Because our call is to be gospel people that live it. And we do this to proclaim it to ourselves regularly, to remind us what it is to be a believer, and remind us what we're to be about as believers. Amen? Let's pray.